very exciting for me. I don't often get to talk about what I'm actually doing in my dissertation to people who will understand. So this is very exciting for me. Um, before I get going, I know I've already said so to Connor, but if you do feel like live tweeting, by all means, um, I put my Twitter handle on there, so please make use of that. So classics and comics, it's a field, well it's two different fields that people don't necessarily think of as being related. Uh, and when they do, people most often look at classics and comics through the perspective of perception. They look at the way the classical world is presented in modern comics and how that influences our perspective on the ancient world. What I do though is a little different. What I find really interesting as a narratologist, as someone who studies narrative, is how novels, how comics, how video games use tools that are unique to those media in order to build their narratives. And so in so doing, I looked at Latin Elegy, which is a wonderful ancient form of poetry. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a second. And I started noticing patterns between the way that Latin Elegy possibly is developing narratives or developing motifs and themes. And I started noticing how similar it is to the way we develop stories in comic books. Most narratologists, people like Beau, Jeanette, most of them look to traditional novels in order to understand how narrative is developed, how we understand narrative um, as readers. But for a form like Latin elegy, and any of you who've read Latin elegy will recognize that it is a fragmented genre. It is a series of individual poems found in sequence that perhaps a more fragmented um, narrative form like comics would be more appropriate to, to reading and under, really understanding these poems. So that's essentially what I'm doing in my dissertation. The talk today is just one fragment of it. It's just, to, to return to fragments, um, it's just one of the chapters. And before I really get going into the, into the nitty gritty narratological stuff, I'd really like to discuss, first of all, what is comics? Most of us probably have some concept of what a comic is. Most of us imagine something like this probably something that may have appeared in your uh, Sunday newspaper, um, or fairly traditional comics like Superman, Batman, of course Watchmen, which this is from. And we don't think very much about how it's actually built. How is it unique as a form of, as a form of storytelling? How is it unique as a medium? One of my favorite comic scholars is a man named Scott McCloud, and in the 1990s he wrote a really foundational book called Understanding Comics. And this is how he chose to define the form. He called them juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. And the element there that I really want to draw your attention to is the deliberate sequence. This isn't just random images thrown together. This is a, a bit of a curated experience. The comics author is intentionally putting images beside each other to create a response in the reader. Another comics scholar named uh, Terry Gronstein has commented on the comics image, and he writes that the comics image, whose meaning often remains open when it is presented as isolated and without verbal anchorage, finds its truth in sequence. And that's really what I want to get at here today, is the importance of sequence to storytelling in comics. We can see that in an example like this. This isn't actually from a comic, this is from a video game, one of my other interests. But if we take one of these images in isolation, say the third from the left, we understand what that is. We recognize it from our other interactions with um, prehistoric cave paintings. But the image taken in isolation doesn't tell a story. The director and the designer of this video game, by adding it into the sequence though, imbues it with meaning, with narrative. Instead of just an image of a cave painting, excuse me, it's now one step in an anthropocentric history of the universe. And this is really the power of comics, and really what, where meaning is found in this, in this sequence. The important element of the sequence is found here. Not in the wonderful images that we see in comics, but in the white space that separates two panels, the gutter. This is really the center of meaning in comics. This is where the reader is able to imbue meaning on the two separate images that they have seen. In a sequence like this, we might not see the importance of that, these being two very close moments in time, 
But if we look at this example, again, from Stop the Cloud, we see a little more how readerly involvement is, very, is essential to comics. The reader takes these two panels in sequence, sequence again. In the first, one man coming at another with an axe, now you die. And then in the second panel, a screen over the, laid over a seascape. We as the reader understand that this man has just been killed. But nowhere on the page is the man actually murdered. It's the, audit, it's the, it's the reader who does that. We take these two images in sequence, we recognize internal elements that relate them to one another, and we fill in the gutter. We fill in the gutter with the meaning that is implied by these two images. McLeod goes on to write that every act committed to the paper by the comics artist is aided and abetted by a silent accomplice, an equal partner in crime known as the reader. When we look at an abstract comic like this, this is Blanco's Papa, um, we really see how this, this works. Abstract comics essentially approach the task of, as one of reader-created meaning. They produce a series of images like this that may not apparently be related, but the fact that they're put in sequence means that the reader will approach them as though they are related and will pull out meaning, will pull out similar images, similar ideas. A lot of people think that perhaps this man and this man are the same. Others have suggested that this big image is in fact a tadpole and this is sort of an inspiration story. But the meaning here is left up to the reader. Turning to Latin elegy, I know there are undergrads here and people who aren't classicists, so I'm going to quickly summarize Latin elegy as a form. It's one of my favorite forms of literature because it's, it's just fascinating and layered. But it's really written only in a very specific, in a very limited period of time, from the fall of the Roman Republic and into the reign of Augustus. Really, only a period of 60 years is it being produced in Rome, in the Roman Empire. It focuses on themes of love, gender, and sexuality. It's largely written from a male perspective, although not exclusively. And it's replete with tropes. Um, one of the things that ties it with comics, and if you read my book, you'll know all about it. But <laughs> These tropes um, include stock characters. Uh, they're largely, these poems are largely written as though autobiographical, although they are not really. And so the poet writes from the first person perspective. The second important character is the Puella. This is the young woman who the poet has fallen at least in lust with, who wishes to engage in an elegiac relationship. And the third character that's going to be important for my talk today is the Weir. A lot of older translations will translate him as being the Puella's husband, but this is a very old-fashioned translation. But really, she's the, he's the man who has um, more wealth, more social esteem. He has more of a claim on the Puella's sexual interest, essentially. She, he is the poet's enemy, competition for the Puella. These poems are always written in elegiac couplets, unlike epic, which is written in hexameter verse. And I put this lovely little poem from Coleridge that expresses what that sounds like to an English audience. In the hexameter rises the fountain silvery column, in the pentameter eye falling in melody back. What I'm going to look at today are the first seven poems from Ovid's Amorius. Ovid is an elegist, among many other things. And he's writing elegiac poetry at the end of the, the line of elegists, essentially. He's kind of our, our big finale. He's wonderful. Everyone should read. <laughs> but these are the first seven poems of the Amores. And if we read a brief definition of them, a brief explanation of what they're about, there isn't any apparent link between them. There's no real narrative that comes out. And I'm just going to read them out loud. In poem 1 1, Cupid forces the poet to write elegy instead of epic, which he'd really prefer to be writing. In 1 2, the poet is in love, is in love, but he lacks a lover. In poem 1 3, the poet prays that his poella love him, he's not found a woman to desire. In poem 1 4, the poet attends a dinner party with his poella and her weir. In poem 1 5, the poet and his poella, who's, named, who's now named as Corinna, have sex in the afternoon. In poem 1-6, the poet begs Corinna's doorkeeper to let him enter her house. And in poem 1-7, the 
the poet has just struck his poella and is expressing regret. So if we just look at that very superficially, as I said, there isn't a clear narrative that's being exposed here. And so for a long time, scholars of Latin elegy have really seen it not as possible narrative material, but as a mosaic of poems, a collection of poems on a theme, if you will. Similar characters, similar tropes might appear, but there isn't a story here, at least so people thought. Vane in the 1980s wrote that Roman erotic elegy resembles a montage of quotations and cries from the heart. This was really the attitude about that elegy. More recently, of course, other scholars have been re-looking at this, myself included, and in 2008, Selzman Mitchell described the Amores and Latin love elegy more generally as narrating stories through a succession of snapshots without explicit links, and it is the task of the reader to connect the pictures and imagine the events that operate as transitions. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds an awful lot like comics. And so essentially that's what I posit in my dissertation, and that's what I'm going to propose today. That we look at these seven poems not as poems found in isolation, in a codex on a single page, but instead as part of a sequence. The way we might find comic panels on, on a comic, in a comics book, or incidentally the way we might have found these poems initially on a, the original papyrus scrolls. They're poems in a sequence, and thus we can look to them and find internal elements that not only link them together, but actually develop some very interesting motifs that grow and change throughout the poem, throughout the poem, I should say. So starting with poem 1-1, one, one, um, this is the opening uh, two couplets, fairly well known at this point. Arms and violet war I was preparing to produce in great number, with manner suiting the matter. The subsequent verses were equal, but Cupid, having laughed, it said, snatched away one foot. For those of you who aren't schooled in Latin elegy or Latin poetry, this is essentially all the writing that I wanted to write epic, I wanted to write poetry about arms and war. I was writing it as such, I was writing it in hexameter, but Cupid came along and snatched away one foot of poetry. He turned one line of hexameter into pentameter and thus forced him to write elegy. But what's really interesting here is right from the start, the relationship that's developed is not between the poet and a girlfriend, a puella, or even a young man. Instead, it's the relationship between the poet and the divine, between poet, the poet, and Cupid. Most other elegy, we find the poella um, not only in the first poem of the books, but often within the first line, often within the first few words. And so the poella is usually the focus. Here, however, she's being shunted to one side in favor of the god of love. In poem 1-2, we see a continuation, perhaps a resolution of the struggle between the two of them. In 1-1, one, one, the poet Ovid goes on at length about why he shouldn't be inspired by Cupid, why Cupid should go away, why he would prefer to be writing epic. But in 1-2, it's apparent that the poet has now accepted his position. He is now in love. He might not have someone to be in love with, but he is certainly suffering from elegiac love. At the end of 1-1, one, one, Cupid is crowned with a myrtle wreath, notably linking him to his mother, Venus. It's identified as myrtle from the shore. So Venus is myrtle, essentially. And this appears again in Hold 1-2, this time as Cupid is literally leading the poet in a Roman triumph. He discusses, he, he describes being led by Cupid in chains through the street. So this is, for all that he is ostensibly written off, the fact that he's not writing about epic, he's not writing about um, arms or warfare, he's still going back to those illusions. He's still referring to his relationship with this divine figure in terms of violence, in terms of conquest. And in these terms, he is the conquered. The idea, of course, of militia amoris, um, military imagery being used as a synonym for sex and love in the ancient world, and specifically in elegy, is very commonly accepted. But what we find here is the direction of that violence. It's against the poet. The poet is conquered. The poet submits here. Poem 1-2 ends with a reference to Julius Caesar, someone who shares, supposedly, a lineage with Cupid, having also been a descendant of Venus. 
And the poet writes, look at the fortunate wars of your king and Caesar. He conquers with his hand, then protects the conquered with that same hand. In 1-1, Ovid has established that this is a book of poetry. This is about his relationship with Cupid. In one, and he struggles against that, of course, that conquest. In 1-2, however, he accepts it. He recognizes that he's now in a triumph. He recognizes that he is the servant of Cupid, and he hopes that he treats him well. In poem 1-3, we finally have a Puella introduced. She's not named, even though I put Corinna on the slide with that. Um, but the entire prayer is again framed as a divine relationship. This is a prayer from the poet to the goddess Venus. He's praying that his well will love him back, but she's not addressed, at least not initially. As the poem progresses, however, the addressee shifts. He's very clearly initially talking to Venus, but by the end of the poem, he's very clearly talking to the poella herself. The point of that break, however, is extremely ambiguous. A lot of, many translators have taken this point here, after Catharia Prepes and then after Pei, that, that line break is being the point when Ovid ceases addressing Venus and starts addressing his Puella instead. But if we look back to the Latin, there's nothing that actually indicates that this is where that point is. In particular, it hangs on the definition of the word Akipe. Any good Latin students here will tell you that it has two possible definitions, to hear, or to take, or to receive. So if we, if we translate Akipe as to hear, then he's still addressing Venus. I'll read that. Ah, I have asked too much. Let her at least suffer to be loved. Let Venus hear my many prayers. Hear one who serves you through long years. Hear one who knows how to love with pure faith. And that flows very nicely. If we take Akipe instead to mean to take or to receive, then it's a little more ambiguous. Take one who serves you through long years. Take one who knows how to love with pure faith. That's much more the address of a lover than it is a divine call. So right from the start, the identity of the Puella has been obscured behind a mask of the divine, behind Cupid, now behind Venus. And although the Puella does exist, she's still very ambiguously framed. She's still very blurred with the divine. And the poet here openly accepts the subservience. As I said in 1-1, he fought back against his subservience, his con the conquest of him by Cupid. In poem 1-2, he accepts it, perhaps grudgingly. Here, he almost brags about it. He talks about, as I said, let her at least suffer to be loved. He doesn't really, ha he at least pretends not to have any particular desires himself. And he highlights his subservience both to the Puella and to, the, and to Venus. He begs both of them for love, the material for the po his poetry, most importantly. He demeans his social status. He talks about his family not being very important. And he verbally accepts his servitude to them both. This is, he might have been fighting back in 1 1, but what he's accepted in 1 2, he's now openly accepting in 1 3. So again, returning to that gutter, we see this gradual development of the motif of the Puella and the Divine and the motif of the poet as a conquered, as one who's been conquered by the divine. Turning to 1-4, <clears throat> we have yet another prayer. This one is a little bit more, I hate to say fun, but Ovidian is perhaps a better way of describing it, as it opens with um, a prayer that the weir will die. This poem addresses a dinner party that the poet is attending along with his poella and her weir. And right from the opening, he's hostile to the weir. He asks, oh, let this be his last meal, essentially. The entire poem is composed of instructions that he's addressing to his poella about how she, sh she should behave at this dinner party towards him, how she should send him secret messages without her weir knowing, and then finally, how she should behave towards her weir. Then he will take kisses from you. Then he will take not just kisses. What you give him secretly, you will give by the force of law. You give unwillingly, you can do that, as though coerced. Let your flattery be silent, and let Venus be mean. If my prayers are strong, I wish that she grants him no pleasure. If not, then at least there is no pleasure for you. Very thoughtful lover here. <laughs> but essentially, again, we have 
even in what's framed as instructions to the Puella, a blurring of identity. Not only is Venus brought up as a synonym for sex, sex with the Puella, notably, but also if you look at the, at the word choice here, Ovid switches from the second to the third person. Is he addressing the goddess or is he addressing the Puella directly? It changes, it shifts, even within a single sentence. And so still we have a continuation of this blurring. Um, the poet is still treating his Puella almost as an extension of Venus herself. We also have things beginning to change a little bit in terms of the poet's subservience. I said from the beginning that the poem opens with him wishing death upon the weir, but he also, partly through his uh, monologue, describes a rape fantasy he has about the Puella herself. In so doing, he compares his desire for her to the desire of the centaurs when they kidnapped and raped him with Jemaya. And he writes that, I've ceased wondering that when drunk, the daughter of Atrax was dragged off in the arms of hybrid men. My home is not in the woods, nor are my limbs like those of a horse. Yet I barely seem to be able to keep my hands off you. Now, it's very nice that he desires his Puella, yet that desire here is being couched in violent terms. This isn't this isn't even Jupiter kidnapping one of his, his lovers. He's comparing himself to a centaur, a half-beast. He might not be, if his words hung like a horse, but he's still bestial in his desires and violent in his desires. This is not a happy brain, if there could be one in the ancient world. This is a violent kidnapping that he's fantasizing about. And so in 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, we've seen him come to accept his subservience, Yet here in 1.4, when we read into the gutter, we start to recognize that that acceptance is not complete. He's still struggling back. He's expressing frustration through these violent, these violent fantasies. The Puella may still be thoroughly blurred with Venus, with the divine, yet the poet is, is shifting, is changing. He's not happy to be conquered, and he's starting to express that. When we move on to poem 1-5, probably if any of you have read any of this book, it's been poem 1-5. Um, this is where we first get uh, Corinna named, aka Corinna Winit, is what it says. Um, and poem 1-5 is essentially a romp in the afternoon. He is lying in the day heat, daydreaming about anything, and then Corinna appears and they have sex. Quite a while ago, actually in the 1980s, a scholar named Nicole had already noticed that Corinna's appearance here, the way she enters the room, is very reminiscent of the divine apparitions in Virgil's Aeneid. The time of day is particularly highlighted. It's the realm of the hour of noon on the rites. The poet stresses the suddenness of Corinna's arrival, just like the arrival of the, um, the divine apparitions in the Aeneid. And he employs the term eke, which also appears in at least two of the four divine apparitions in Virgil. Yet people, even though, as I've established in the first four poems, there is this wonderful precedent set by, set by Ovid already that Corinna is Venus, people have not extended that before this. People saw this, her arrival, as perhaps programmatic of his, his, um, his approach to her, but it appears in 1-5 and it doesn't come up again. As I've shown, though, there's already this long-standing precedent right from 1-1 that where the poet approaches Corinna as a divine figure. He's treating her like a goddess. And so her arrival as a goddess here isn't surprising, it's expected. The poem ends with yet another prayer that is again ambiguously worded. He asks, may such middays often come to me. Is he asking his girlfriend, let's do this again, or is he praying to the gods? Is he praying to Venus that he'd like this to happen again? Further, again, blurring the Puella with the Venus, with Venus, I should say. Further, we have a reappearance of possibly a rape fantasy. Ovid describes in relative detail um, their sexual encounter, and he describes their initial kind of the initial act of seduction, if you will, as I plundered her tunic, not harming the thin fabric very much, yet she struggled to cover herself with the tunic. While she would fight so, it was as if she did not want to win. 
she was effortlessly conquered by her own betrayal. He's clearly reading her resistance as being all part of the fun, all part of the game of elegiac love. Whether or not it's consensual, though, and it is important that we ask that, whether or not it's consensual, their sexual engagement is still being framed as an act of violence. She fights back. He, he tries not to rip her tunic. He forces her down. So whether or not she's playing along or not, this, what he makes very clear, is a very satisfying sexual encounter for him, is violent, in which he is the conqueror now. He may have been fantasizing about it in 1-4. Here, he is in the very least play-acting it. That fantasy of violence that is starting to, in their relationship, is starting to emerge. In poem 1-6, as a reminder, this is the poem in which Ovid, or the poet, stands before the door of his beloved as begging to be, begging to be let in. It's the middle of the night, he's been out drinking. He turns up with his laurel wreath kind of jauntily, jauntily sitting on his head. But he approaches, at least ostensibly, as somebody who's fairly peaceful. He doesn't approach as a threat. Who's afraid of an army like this? Who isn't open to them? He asks. Yet very quickly, this dissolves again into, into violent threats. The terminology, even of his claim to innocence, is interesting. He compares himself to an army tool of violence. Soon he thinks he hears the door moving. He he asks, oh, is that the is that the hinge squeaking? But no, it's just the northern wind. And he takes this opportunity to address Boreas, the god of the north wind, and ask him for help. Ask him to, to help him take the house, essentially. And in doing so, he calls to Boreas his own story, referring to his rape of the Athenian princess Orithea. And so and still, we have this consistent theme of violence in their sexual relationship. Soon enough that violence is transferred to the house itself, and he threatens them, or he threatens it, he threatens the house. He says, or I myself am now prepared with iron and fire, which I hold in a torch to attack this proud house. Clearly, Ovid, the poets, the characters, the frustration is building. He wants to get in to her house. He's frustrated that he's being turned away. Long gone is that subservience of 1-3. Having read into the gutters between 1-3, 1-4, 1-5, and now 1-6, we see this developing frustration from simple threats, simple threats in 1-4, an apparent rape fantasy fulfilled in 1-5, and here, overt and verbal threats against the house. At the end of poem 1-6, though, we still have this call back to the fact that she's divine. We have Ovid take off his laurel wreath and lay it on her doorstep. It's to remind her that he's been, he's been a good boy. He's been out waiting for her all night. But if we look at the terminology of this particular passage, and I'm sorry I didn't include it here, it's extremely reminiscent of a later moment in Ovid's memorials when Corinna herself approaches the altar of Osiris and leaves a similar offering on his altar. This might be a reminder to, to a lover that He's been there, that he's a good boy, but it's also a mortal, the poet, attending the divine's altar, attending his beloved's altar, and leaving an offering there for her. In poem 17, all of this culminates. Um, it does continue, there is more than just what I'm talking about today, but in poem 17, we really see a culmination of both of these themes. They come together in what is a violent situation. The poet has struck his lover in anger, and he's literally sitting there as he's writing the poem, begging her for forgiveness. <clears throat> but the violence that he's, he's, that he's brought against the Puella is entirely framed in a religious manner. We're reminded that she is divine, and that the reason why this violence is so, is so awful why he needs to beg her forgiveness is because of that religious element. He writes, he compares it to being violent against his own parents or ferociously taking whips to the sacred gods. He actually describes it as, this violence, as sacrilegi, the origins of our term sacrilegious. And again, he goes back to mythological precedent, it being odd that he always does. And he refers to Diomedes as striking Venus, again conflating the two. 
the two figures. He was the first to strike a goddess, then me. And I left the article ambiguous because, of course, for those of you who speak Latin, there are no articles in Latin. And so the article is ambiguous. Is he referring to he struck any goddess, or is he saying that he was the first to strike this goddess, to strike Venus? By reading into these gutters, by seeing the fact that the Puella has been established as something of an extension of Venus and keep it right from the start, we can now look at this and find this internal element that, that continues this theme and now brings it to bear in terms of violence. The poem, towards the end of the poem, the poet mockingly leads his Puella in a triumph as well. Mockingly, though, he recognizes that this violence is inappropriate. His role is one of subservience. He has been conquered. He should not be striking his Puella. He should not be striking the divine who has conquered him. And yet, as we've seen by reading into the gutters that separate these poems, there has been a frustration that's been developing in the poet, right, from one four to here, that has now physically, literally, struck out against the Puella. I'm going to be very ahead of time. That's great. <laughs> So I think the important question here is to ask, so what? So we find all these internal elements that connect. What is the importance here? Well, for anybody who studies narrative and narratology, causality is really the essence of narrative. And that's what we bring out here. By looking at these poems in sequence, by reading them as panels on a comics page, by looking for internal consistencies that tie them together, we as readers are better able to read into that gutter and to understand why things are happening as they do. Why does Corinna appear to be a divinity in 1-5? Well, she's been established that way, right from the beginning. Why does the ego leave a laurel wreath on her doorstep? Because for all that he might want to break down the door so he can have his way with her, he's still approaching her in that same divine light. And why in 1-7 does the poet, has the poet struck his girlfriend, has struck Puella? Because we've seen this developing frustration from panel to panel, from poem to poem that's now culminated in this final act of violence. There's a wonderful quote from the comic scholar Lefebvre, who wrote that, the reader has to accept the arrangement of the panels on the page is not random but directed, and that the panels are interconnected. And what I hope I've shown here today is that that's not just true of panel, the panels in comics, but it's also true of poems in Latin elegy. For so long, partially I think because we read this, this poetry in a codex as opposed to on a papyrus scroll, we've treated each poem in isolation. We've treated them as, as not connected, except perhaps occasionally here and there. But instead, if we read them this way, we're allowed to pull out these overarching themes and tropes that have been overlooked. We can track the development of characters. We see the poet's growing frustration, his growing understanding of the poela. And so we can draw these connections and possibly even build a narrative that we haven't, we haven't found in, in, pardon me, in Latinology before. Thank you.